Okay, let's say we have cracked open memory and we found 32 bits. What do they mean? We don't know what they mean because we don't know what representation put them there. There are different ways to interpret patterns of ones and zeros. If we don't know exactly what it's been defined as, we can't tell you what it equals. Heck, it could equal an instruction to be executed by the processor. But let's say that this is a value, data, something being stored. These 32 bits could be, well, unsigned binary. If they're unsigned binary, the value could be all the way up to 2 to the 32 minus 1, a really, really big number. Don't worry, I've done the conversion for us. This value could be, let's see, an unsigned binary. This could be, what is it, 1,499,822,000. Oh, wow. Okay, now it could be signed. Now, if it was signed, what that means, two's complement. We'll just talk about two's complement. If it was two's complement, then this could be a positive or negative number. This most significant bit would identify it as a positive number if it uh, starts with a zero, a negative number if it starts with a one. Fortunately, it starts with a zero, so actually two's complement is the same as unsigned. So the two's complement will also be. 1,499,820,833. Okay. What if it is biased or offset? Now, if it was biased, a lot of the time what we do with biased, if we have a certain number of bits, we take the power of two of this bit and make that our bias or our offset. So this is the two to the 31 position. So bias two to the 31. Wow. That'll give us a negative number. Let's see. That negative number would be, oh, let's see. We figured this out. Negative 647,622,815. So, still a pretty big, big value. What if this was BCD? In BCD, remember, we divide this number into nibbles, and each nibble identifies a different decimal digit. So this would be the ones place, the tens place, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands, millions, billions, millions, ten millions, right? So in, in packed BCD, this would be five, nine, six, five, seven, three, two, one, put our commas in the right place, 5,657,321. Um, what else could this be? Turns out, could be IEEE 754 floating point notation. And if that's the case, well, remember this is our sign bit s the next eight bits one two three four five six seven eight this is our exponent right and then the rest of it this is our fraction so in i triple e 754 this guy could be i also did this calculation for us would be 4.0365222 and a heck of a lot more digits times 10 to the 15. So there are a number of ways that this could be represented. But you notice all of those are numbers, right? We haven't even talked about letters yet. Now in the 1960s, early 1960s, a group of people got together and came up with something, and we'll go ahead and write this down. This would be the American standard, and it's a code for information interchange, otherwise known as ASCII. Now, there's an important thing to understand about ASCII, and it's this first word, American. Um, doesn't mean that nobody else could use it. It's just that, well, Americans only have 26 letters in, their alpha, in the alphabet, and it's that 
that A, B, C's. And, and other languages like Spanish has Enya and uh, German has the S, and there's all sorts of other characters, but this didn't account for that because, and please understand, this was not meant to be exclusive. It was just meant that back in those days, it was never dreamed that we would interchange information. There was no, there were no cell phones. There was, there was no internet. There was basically, if you had a, had an opera, had a program running on your computer, it was running on just that machine. There was no interchange with other devices. So American standard code for information interchange. And what they did was they said, what we're going to do is we're going to take these patterns of ones and zeros, and we are going to have them represent characters. And in fact, What's interesting about this is that they figured out that if after they kind of put together all of the characters that they thought they would need to represent, they really only needed to have seven bits to represent a character. I mean, if you think about this, um, there were like 25 punctuation marks and mathematical symbols and space and carriage return and line fade, things like that that they would use. Um, there were 26 uppercase letters, and in fact, the original standard only used uppercase letters. They didn't even worry about lowercase letters. Everything was just going to be capitalized, shouting all the time, right? Then there's 26 lowercase letters. So right now we're up to, what, 77, something like that? Um, they had some control characters, some unprintable control characters, uh, everything from uh, a null and, and something that indicated that we had an end of a message, uh, something that was indicated that um, uh, there was, in fact, there was a bell, there was an audible bell to make it so that there was a ding as part of the message. Um, well. That was less than 127 or 128, which was all the patterns of ones and zeros we needed for eight bits. Now, if you look, I'm a squeaky pen again, and we divide this up into seven bits. So we have seven bits. And what happens is if we are storing or sending eight bits anyway, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna automatically assume this most significant bit is a zero all the time, all right? It is possible to communicate back and forth between machines with just seven bits, but in this case, we're looking at an eight bit. You know, we've talked about this before. We like to do things in eight bits. Um, this most significant bit is always gonna be a zero. Now, these most significant two bits, they, or excuse me, uh, yeah, the most significant two bits, they, tended to categorize the, uh, the type of character that we were showing. So if it started with a zero, zero, what you were looking at was mostly control. So um, this thing, like I said, uh, end, of t end of text or um, um, you know, these, these, these um, uh, line feeds, carriage returns, form feed, there was a lot of printer type information that came in there. So if it started with zero, zero, we had, well, how many bits do we have left? One, two, three, four, five, two to the fifth, that's 32 patterns. So there were 32 patterns that would be, that, that would be part of those, uh, um, that, we, that we could use with those, all right? Now, if it started with a zero, one, this zero, one tended to be, punctuation and numbers. All right. Now, the interesting thing was that numbers, all the numbers, so starting with zero all the way up to nine. So uh, zero, one, and then one, zero, 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 zero was zero. Zero, one, one, zero, 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 one, that was one. So really what you were looking at was the numbers themselves always started with zero, one, one, which meant that all you had to do, you notice this nibble right here was a hexadecimal three. And this nibble right here was whatever the decimal digit was. So you got real used to in your programming language if you wanted to convert an actual nibble zero through nine, to this ASCII, you would, all you had to do was just add a zero, uh, excuse me, a three zero hex to it. It would automatically create the, um, create the ASCII version of that number. If it started with one zero, in addition to some 
some addition, some punctuation like parentheses and, and, and so forth. This was for the most part uppercase letters. All right. And if it started with one one, it was lower case letters. All right. And in and, and some additional punctuation, because like I said, there are 32 patterns of ones and zeros there. So what we've got is the 26 letters A through Z plus, you know, 10 different characters or excuse me, um, uh, six different characters. Now, something that was interesting about these things, if you wanted to change something between uppercase and lowercase, all you had to do was either turn this guy a bit to a zero or turn that bit to a one. Just 50, flipping back and forth between zero and one, the letters, the capital A and the lowercase a, lined up with those bits just fine. All you had to do was just clear or set that bit in order to go from uppercase to lowercase. So let's take a look at this number again. And, and I realize things have gotten a little messy from whenever I first put this up on the board, but let's see what we can do with it. Now, let's assume that now what we've actually got is 8 bits, 8 bits, 8 bits, and then 8 bits. All right? Now, what you can see, and, and in fact, let's take a look at an ASCII table. This ASCII table that we're looking at right now, um, it, it shows you in the columns the most significant three bits of the ASCII value. And the rows are identified with the least significant four bits of the ASCII value. So you've got the seven bits total. So if we look at this first value and we go over to column, or excuse me, we'll, we'll take a look at the, the rows first. We look at the least significant four bits of that first byte. That first byte is 1001. Those last four bits of that first byte are 1001. We go down to the ninth row or the 1001 row. Okay, that row we then follow across to the column 101. And then 101, where those two intersect, we see that this is a capital Y. All right, capital letter Y. Let's look at the next byte. The next byte is 0110-0101. All right, let's once again start with the least significant four bits, the 0101. We go down the rows until we find the row identified by 0101 and go across until we get to the column identified by 110. That gives us the lowercase e. The next, the next eight bits, the next byte. The next byte is 0111-0011. And in fact, we can go back and talk about, uh, you know, what I'd, with those most significant two bits. The most significant two bits of those seven bits are 11, so we know this is gonna be a lowercase letter. The previous byte, the most significant two bits were 11. We knew that was gonna be a lowercase letter and it turned out to be a little e. The first one, the most significant two bits of the seven bits are one zero. That gave us a capital letter, a capital Y. Now getting back to this third, this third uh, byte, the last four bits of the seven bits are zero, zero, one, one. Zero, zero, one, one, we go down the row and then go across until we find the column identified by the most significant three bits of those seven bits, one, one, one. 111 gives us the last column where we see a lowercase s. Now let's look at the last byte. The last byte, take away that most significant zero, that most significant bit zero, and we've got the seven bits 010, 0001. So we go down to the row 0001, that's the second row down, and then go across and notice the most significant two bits of those seven bits are zero, 01, which means it's a punctuation or a number. We go across to the column identified by 010 and we see an exclamation point, the punctuation that we're looking for. All right. All right. So these 32 bits in, and let's go ahead and write this down in our last bit in ASCII represent the text string capital Y 
little e, little s, exclamation point. There you go. Could have represented that too, huh? Kind of looks like it did. Now, the key thing that we were talking about with this is that term American. We're going to see how the ASCII was a starting point for something we call code points with something we call Unicode. So next time, the next lesson, we're going to be talking about Unicode and something called the UTF-8 encoding, where we take a Unicode code point and set it up so that it can be sent from one device to another.